Your mercy never fails me, and all my days I am held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God.
Hey everybody, I'm so happy to have all of you with us wherever you're watching from. Welcome to Dulles Church. I'm our host today. And I wanted to start before we get to the message with a few quick updates. And the very first thing is a thank you. So many of you give back to God financially here at Dulles Church. Uh, I found out from our bookkeeper just a few days ago that December's giving in 2020 exceeded the years before. Thank you for your special contributions. And just a little bit of context. This may be new for some of you. Uh, I mentioned to somebody the week before Christmas Eve that our production cost for the big screen in the parking lot and the drive-in that we were going to do, our total cost was around $3,800. And they sort of gasped and they were like, wait a minute, what? And I could see the surprise in their face and I just had a conversation with them. Yeah, it surprises people how much it costs to run a church and how much it costs for a church to invest into the community. And so many of you are investors and give with us here. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who have giving letters and giving statements on their way to you this month for your 2020 giving, please be sure that you get regular emails from us. If you don't get a weekly email from me or regular emails from the church, it probably means we need to update your email address. Will you just hit the connect button and let us know what your current email address is? And we will be sure to email you in the coming days, the coming week or 10 days or so, your 2020 giving statement. Okay, also a reminder that our merch is available for one more day. I think today actually is the last day. I shouldn't say I think, but I think today is it for our winter merchandise here at Dulles Church. So you can click the link here if you're watching live or you can go to our website for information about how to get your winter gear from Dulles Church. One more thing, and that is our Super Bowl chili kits. The Dulles South Food Pantry is collecting chili kits for many in our area here in the Dulles area to have lunch uh, provided for them on Super Bowl Sunday. We are investing in that and I'm calling on every single person Every one of you that watches, that is a part of the Dulles family, will you invest in this? Either make a small financial contribution for that project and we'll get a kit for you. If you're here in the Dulles area, prepare a kit with your kids, your family members, and the drop-off location is Christina Bartz's house on January 31st. I get to introduce now one of my dear, dear friends. Josh and I have been close for about 15 years now. He has spoken here at Dulles many times over the years and just last year, about a year ago, officially became part of our teaching team here at Dulles. So I'm joining all of you uh, this weekend to lean in and listen to and learn from this man's heart for God and all that he has been up to lately in chasing after the calling of God and the heart of God. I know that you're going to be inspired today. I'll be back with you in just a little bit when Josh is done. Everybody, Joshua Simonette. DCC is so, so good to be with you this weekend. Excited uh, to be sharing with you. Um, you know what? I'm, I'm actually going to take my glasses off um, this time. I, I can't seem to get the lighting right. Uh, it always just has this glare and I don't want there to be uh, a distraction. But as I was saying, I'm excited to be sharing with you and we're going to zoom in on Mark chapter 10. Uh, so we'll get there in just a moment. But before we do that, hey, just wanted to remind you in case you didn't know or tell you again that, hey, we're honoring, uh, celebrating a, a great man this weekend, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, Dr. King sacrificed his life literally for his calling and he was uh, a modern day prophet and one of the reasons why i say he was a modern day prophet if you've studied uh, the prophets at all or know anything about the, the prophets in the bible they they literally had one job and uh that job was holding people accountable to god's commands now one a very popular job very sexy job one too many people signing up you know, for that job. And, and the prophets sometimes were on the run um, or in hiding because of, of what uh, message they had to share from God. But, but here's the thing. If we're honest, 
speaking of prophets holding people accountable to God's commands, like we don't love to be held accountable. Like if we're just being honest, what would we love is to do what we feel, when we feel, how we feel like doing it, right? Why? Because that makes us more comfortable. But many times the, the prophet's message was directly aimed at comfort. It was directly aimed to disrupt that comfort. And I think many of the things that Dr. King said, looking back upon it, um, were aimed uh, at discomfort. They, they was similar uh, type messages. And, and, and one of those I think is relevant for us this weekend, given what I want to share with you. And, and I just want to um, just share a snippet from uh, letters from a Birmingham jail, which Dr. King wrote uh, April 16th, 1963. And if you have not read that, I want to encourage you to uh, find a few moments to read it. And uh, Dr. King is addressing clergy in this letter specifically, but I would say a secondary audience would be anyone who is a Jesus follower. I would say a tertiary audience would be just any a decent person. Uh, but, but here's what Dr. King said. He said, I am disappointed with the white moderate. Now, you got to understand that the white moderate was, was not the extremist, was not the KKK, was, it was not the, the white supremacist. Uh, for the most part, these were decent people. For the most part, these were at least people of, of goodwill. And, and here is what he said to this group, or, or here's a snippet of what he said. He said several things, but he said, shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. Basically, what Dr. King is saying here is that the real enemy is not the extremist. It's, it's not uh, the person who is who is uh, outwardly hateful. It's not the person who is uh, uh, participating in violence, um, not, not being an intimidator, but it's the person who who is comfortably, comfortably in the middle, the moderate person. Those who um, are basically insulated to a certain extent. Decent people, but also shallow people. People, let me take it a step further, who prioritize comfort over calling to a higher mission. People who only want order to be achieved comfortably. People who just say, let's pray for peace in the time of civil unrest. Now, there, there isn't anything wrong with praying for peace, but we must understand um, and not be shallow in our understanding that peace is a byproduct of justice. And justice requires a greater sacrifice, often discomfort. And I should just tell you that following Jesus is not comfortable. It is something that is uh, very, very challenging and goes against the grain of our culture and the world that we live in. It, it, it goes against the grain of the American dream that we talk about and we think about and that we pursue goes against this comfortable life. Now, just as a side note, I, there's nothing wrong with comfortable things in life. There's nothing wrong with enjoying certain comforts. I, I'm excited about uh, my neighborhood and the bed I get to sleep in and my wife's cooking and, and all of these uh uh, things that I enjoy in life. There's nothing wrong with those things. You don't need to apologize for comforts in life. But here's the thing. When you make those things priority, when you make those things for all intents and purposes, your God, that's where the problem lies because it gets in the way. In the way of what? What am I talking about? Well, well let's transition to Mark chapter number 10. 
uh, with those thoughts in mind as we continue the series that you've been in uh, called First Things First. I want to talk this weekend using a simple subject for, for my message, calling over comfort, calling over comfort. One of the recorders of Jesus's earthly ministry is a guy named Mark. And uh, Mark shares a story of an affluent person that two other gospel writers, uh, both Luke and Matthew, record the, the same story. And it's about this guy that is known as a rich young ruler. He's someone of importance and he's someone of influence. Now, we don't know what his age is. We don't know what his occupation is. We just know he's an affluent person. And when they say young, I mean, in the Jewish context, like you were considered young until you were like 40 years old, uh, which is encouraging to me as I, you know, crossed over into 40 a couple of years. So still feeling pretty young myself. But but he's a rich, young, influential person is what we know. And here's the context. All right. So he runs into Jesus. He kneels before him because he obviously knows that this is this is Jesus. That he's, he's supposed to be the son of God. And he also knows a little bit about the gospel message. He knows a little bit about the scriptures um, because he knows that uh, uh, eternal life is uh, the inheritance that God has promised. And then he asked Jesus a simple question. He just says, what can I, what should I do uh, to inherit internal, eternal life? Right? Reasonable, simple question, right? Jesus says, Keep the commandments. He lists a few of the commandments. And it's almost like you can feel the, the excitement. You can feel the validation that the rich young ruler uh, has in his response to Jesus. He's like, yo, okay, cool. Like, I, I, I got that. Like, I've been doing that. I've been keeping the command. As a matter of fact, I've been doing that since I was a shorty. So I'm good on that. Is there anything else? And then we pick it up in verse 21. Uh, in verse 22, just two verses. And here's what it says. Looking at him, Jesus loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But he was dismayed by this demand. And he went away grieving because he had many possessions. He had a bunch of stuff, y'all. Listen, I can only imagine how disappointed this guy must have felt. I, I can only imagine how crushed he feels. The reason is because he obviously had different expectations. I mean, he goes from like, yes, I, I'm keeping the commandments. I'm good on that. Matter of fact, I've been doing that for a while since, since I was young to the air being sucked out of him because of what else Jesus said he needed to do. You see, he wanted to follow Jesus only in a way that was comfortable to him. And I gather that the rich young ruler was probably a good person. He was decent. He was reasonable. I mean, seemingly loved God. He knew his commandments. He followed them. But he was still shallow in his understanding of what it meant to pursue God. <laughs> the conversation reveals his priorities. It also reveals Jesus's priorities. And we can obviously see that they were incongruent. What was first to the rich young ruler, what was priority for him was his possessions and things he had accomplished and his network and his net worth and, and all of those things. And he left grieving because Jesus just asked him to give all of that up. I can't imagine how hard he might have worked. I mean, even if he hadn't worked for it, and let's just say he had rich parents and he inherited it. I mean, to just give all of that up to the poor, people you don't even know, people who hadn't earned it. or, or I mean, for what? For what reason, Jesus? I mean, 
I can understand why he might have been a little bit perplexed. But I got one point for us this weekend and, and just, just one point for you to consider. You see, what Jesus calls his disciples, people who are going to follow him, people who are going to say that, hey, I'm a Christian. When, when, when you're going to follow Jesus, you're signing up for an uncomfortable mission. And, and I just want to sum that uncomfortable mission or, or, or this discomfort up it with one word. It's called sacrifice. So the question for you this weekend is, are you willing to sacrifice the life you prefer versus the life Jesus demands? The life you prefer versus the life Jesus demands. Here's the thing. I, I'm just going to be straight up honest with you. My dad called me this week. This past week, after we had seen what we had, had seen in the nation's capital and and all of the things that have been been transpiring, my, my dad called me as he always does just to check in, see how things are going, see how I'm thinking, how I'm processing. And I told my dad, I said, Dad, you know what? If it was up to me and there was no consequence, I would pack my family up and I would go somewhere far away. Somewhere where I didn't have to worry about the things that we are constantly worried about. Somewhere where I could go potentially and not have to worry about my skin color, not have to worry about, about anything that I felt like has been holding me back. Oh, that's a problem or a reminder of tension, racial tension, political tension, and all of these. So, and, and the reason for that is because I feel like my mission, or what God has called me to, is to be a bridge builder, is to be someone who steps in the middle, someone who works to reconcile. As a Jesus follower, I'm automatically signed up for that. But as a black man, as a black person, I feel like I have been called to uniquely go between different worlds to reconcile. And that's hard, living in the middle. That's hard. Being in that tension, that's hard being misunderstood by sometimes by your own people and being uh, misunderstood uh, by people who don't look like you or who don't understand where you come from. That's difficult. And can I just tell you this too? Dr. King experienced some of the same things, but on a whole nother level. Did you know that not only did Dr. King make great sacrifices in many ways in his life, one of the greatest things that he sacrificed was respect and acceptance amongst his own people, amongst black people. Did you know his approval rating was so low, not just amongst white people who were both extreme and moderate, who just uh, disagreed with him for a, a myriad of reasons, but Dr. King's own people disagreed with him, sometimes worked against him, because they did not believe in this nonviolent movement. They thought it was soft and it wasn't aggressive enough. And there were certain groups and other philosophies out there, and I won't, I won't name them, we don't have time to get in, into that, who felt like, no, we need force. We need to fight force with force. We need to arm ourselves. They take our life, we need to take some lives. But can I tell you something? Dr. King's priority wasn't being accepted by his people, by white people, by any people. Dr. King's priority was Jesus' way, <laughs> the ways of Jesus. And the reason why he wasn't accepted, the reason why it was difficult, because he was going against the grain of culture. We need to look no further than the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew and I'll just give you a couple of things <laughs> and we could just see right off the bat that following Jesus it ain't no joke you have heard it said this is Jesus talking love your neighbor and hate your enemy but I say love them and pray for them Pff, Jesus you tripping <laughs> love them and pray for them bruh come on man People that are trying to kill us, people that are trying to work against us, 
people that's that that's hateful, love them and pray for them. <laughs> that's a major sacrifice, especially when no one would argue against me hating them or retaliating. But Jesus goes further. He said, don't resist the evildoer. He said, someone who wants to sue you for your shirt, give them your coat too. He said, if someone forces you to walk a mile, walk too. Like, Jesus is tripping. Tell me how any of these things are comfortable. I don't know how you can read the Bible, how you can read the scriptures, how you can follow Jesus and think that this is like comfortable. But what we try to do is we try to redefine things or we try to skip over things or we try to justify things in our own eyes because it's more comfortable. Because the sacrifice that Jesus is talking about is a little bit too great. Here's the thing. The rich young ruler felt the same way. He felt like, yeah, this, this sacrifice is just a little bit too much. And so you might be asking real practical questions, right? Okay, so why would Jesus tell this guy to sell all of his stuff? Um, or, or give it away to the poor? Like, for what reason? Well, here's the thing. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said why he came. Listen to this. He said, a thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come so you can have life and have it in abundance. Jesus said he wanted us to have life in abundance. But here's the thing. Part of how the thief, and the thief is a metaphor here for the enemy, our adversary, the devil, Satan, whatever you want to call him. Part of, part of how he steals, kills, and destroys, or his strategy, is to keep us comfortable or preoccupied with stuff that doesn't matter, that's temporary, to keep us moderate. Jesus said, the life I've called you to requires much greater sacrifice. And it requires that I be your first priority. Because if I'm first, everything else will take care of itself and some. And here's the thing, when Jesus talks about abundance, right? He's not talking about more stuff in this life. Although you could get more stuff in this life, but, but, but he's not focusing or, or prioritizing more stuff in this life. He's talking about greater substance for your life or greater substance in your life. You're talking about deeper, not this shallow living. And guess what? Even when we get fulfilled with stuff, it's temporary. The feeling doesn't last. It's not good enough. We want more. It, it just, it just doesn't give us peace. Like we hoped it would. It doesn't, it doesn't protect us either from stuff breaking out in our lives. And here's the thing. We are built to pursue. That's what we're, we're built to pursue. And the only thing that can fulfill us is a life in Jesus. And that's basically what Jesus is trying to tell this rich young ruler, this, this affluent person with all of these things. And see, we got two problems. We think control we, we can control things and, you know, that'll make things better. Well, I, we don't really have control. It's a mirage. It's not really real. <laughs> or, or comfort. That'll make things better. But it just makes us more apathetic. And here's the thing. Jesus just wants our heart. That's it. That's what he wants. Let me see if I can land a plane for us like this this weekend. I, in, in the 60s. Um, this was um, the height of the, the civil rights movement. There was serious racial tension uh, in the country. Uh, it, was, it was much more overt, uh, although the direction we seem to be trending in right now is, is very overt, but it was highly concentrated 
uh, in the in the South. Lots of racial tensions. And one of the biggest fights and what Dr. King was really pushing for was the right for black people to vote. Um, they were not being allowed to vote. And, and that was a huge issue. So they were going to have this march in Selma, Alabama. I'm reminded of, of, of something that happened uh, almost 56 years ago. Uh, 1965, a wife, 39-year-old mother of five, uh, Viola Luizzo, uh, is forever etched in history because she decided she no longer wanted to be moderate. She was one of those people comfortably in the middle, far removed, but she decided, I don't want to be moderate. So she drove from Detroit, Michigan, all the way to Alabama, Selma, Alabama, to join blacks in a fight that was not really her fight. At least that's what she was told. She went to help coordinate and help with this march that was going to happen in Selma. And here's the thing. This was not the place for a white woman. This is not the place. Uh, it was dangerous. Uh, obviously, it was, it was uh, very volatile. Uh, I mean, uh, what was she really going to do? Like, how was she going to really help anything? Um, she has a family. Uh, it's much safer to be in Detroit. She was 800 plus miles and 12 plus hours by car removed from all of this volunteer. She had to literally drive, drive across the country to get to Alabama. When Viola left Detroit, her family did not know that that would be the last time that they would see her alive. KKK members saw Viola driving her car with a 19 year old black man named Leroy Moton, and they shot her in the head twice. Leroy Moton um, played dead in the car so that he wouldn't be killed uh, as well. You know, Viola's husband warned her. He said, Viola, you know, this is not your fight. This has nothing to do with you. Your life is here. There's nothing going on in Alabama that should concern you. And she said, you know what? You're right. It isn't my fight. It's everybody's fight. And Viola's daughter would later say that mom believed Jesus when he said, suffering and needy are our people. Viola was said to be the only white woman to die in the civil rights movement. And I sometimes think about her husband's words because they were rational i mean they were legitimate concerns yes for her safety for her future for her life and no one could really argue against those things just like i can make an argument for the rich young ruler's concern about all that he had accomplished or all that he had that jesus was asking them to give away but what it highlights is our need for control and comfort because it's easier. Because the sacrifice that Jesus is calling us to, whoo, a little bit more than we want to give sometimes. And, and, and it makes sense to, to push back because who wants to be uncomfortable? Nobody's signing up for that. My good friend, um, best selling author and pastor, Mark Batterson, I love the way that he puts this. He says, we follow Jesus to the point of inconvenience, and I added discomfort. See, the rich young ruler, he didn't get that Jesus didn't really care about his stuff. He wasn't concerned about his possessions. He wasn't concerned about his influence, his network, who, who he was, what he had to come. He was concerned about his heart because he knew that if he prioritized the right things, and he made Jesus a priority, everything else would take care of itself. And so I'm wondering this weekend, where's your heart? Because where your heart is, that's where your treasure is also. And what Jesus is concerned with is your heart. And he's called us, those of us who wanna follow him, to do some tough things, but what he has for us is greater 
than anything we could ever have in this life. So he's calling us out of the middle. He's calling us out of that comfortable place. He's calling us to sacrifice. Because Jesus himself sacrificed. He said, God, not my will, but your will be done when it was time for him to go to the cross and make the ultimate sacrifice for us. So my challenge to you this weekend, whether you're considering following Jesus, you're thinking about it, you're processing it, or you're confused about it, or whether you already say that you've been following him, I just want everybody to be on the same page and know it's going to be a great sacrifice. But in the end, it's greater than anything we can ever have here on this earth because Jesus promised us more. He promised us treasures in heaven. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for just how you how you challenged us. God, all of us have stuff in our lives, things going on that um, maybe we're not happy with or we wish would be better. God, help us to pay attention to those things. You might be calling us out of the middle. You might be calling us out of that moderate place. And God, give us the courage to sacrifice and to pursue you whatever it may cost, to give our heart completely to you. God, we thank you for all that you have done, all that you are doing, and all that you will do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, God bless. Until next time. I want to thank all of you for joining us wherever you watch from. If you're here in the Dulles area and you've been joining us at uh, our monthly in-person gatherings. We have another one coming up on Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, a little birdie has told me Joshua Simonette will be back with us in person on Super Bowl Sunday. We'll be online that week, just like normal. Uh, I'll look to see a lot of you online this week in various forums. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you right back here online in one week.